All right. Welcome. Welcome to another episode of the Creditor Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Palmieri, and with me today is Jay Rosen. Jay Rosen is an influential media critic. He's a journalism professor at NYU. He's the director of the Membership Puzzle Project and a writer at PressThink.org. Jay, thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so I thought that we could start with some somewhat breaking news over the last week and a half, which is the situation between Australia and some of these new proposed laws and how Google and Facebook have interacted with these new laws and made decisions as far as how they're going to handle their content or make licensing deals with these with these uh, Australian news agencies. I kind of want to start there because I think that we will agree that Facebook and Google have a really large role to play in the media environment and that this appears to be an attempt to kind of push back and bring revenue back to the publishers. And I think there's a lot of nuance that we can suss out just from this topic. So mm. if you have kind of an overview take on how you think uh, the situation is developing between Facebook and Google and how they've kind of acted differently in response to this proposed legislation. Well, I think this grows out of uh, concern in many countries for the rise of misinformation, disinformation, uh, and other forms of irresponsible communication on their platforms. And at the same time, you have the decline of traditional press and mixed in with that, a part that doesn't get talked about very much in news coverage because the news media is involved in it. Um, the, the newspaper press in many of these countries is still powerful enough to influence politics. So one thing that's going on is that they're using their leverage um, as still potent media in those countries to get favorable treatment. So a British prime minister, for example, can't ignore the tabloids in the UK. A politician in Australia can't ignore the Murdoch empire in Australia. It's too powerful. Um, and so the combination of anxiety about misinformation and disinformation, which are not the same things, and we could distinguish them later on, um, and a kind of a cultural anxiety about the decline of the traditional press have come together to create a lot of incentives for uh, governments to do something about the platforms. Uh, and there are good public policy reasons for that. And there are some dubious public policy reasons like the ones that I just explained for that. Um, I'm with my friend, Jeff Jarvis, who has very strong views on this, that for the most part, the publishers are presenting a weak case in that they get a lot of traffic from the um, platforms uh, the fact that they are unable to do much with that traffic is not the platform's fault. Um, and there's a, the thing that really worries me about some of these um, laws and regulations is that when they strike these deals to help out traditional publishers, um, there, there's no mechanism by which the countries involved can ask where should this money from the platforms be going? And who are the virtuous publishers who deserve it? Um, and very often um, digital startups, uh, the kinds of news organizations we have in the US like Vox.com, just to use one example, but there are many others, wouldn't be included in this largesse that's coming to publishers from the um, platforms. And, when you ask why, there's you know there's really not a good reason for that. So, I think it's a very complex issue, and I do think that, um, and this part I didn't emphasize yet, Facebook especially, but also Google, have not been very serious or very successful at controlling the misuse of their platforms for 
misinformation, disinformation, and in some cases worse than that, like genocide. Uh, and no matter what they say, they, they, they don't act uh, dramatically enough. And maybe it's possible, especially in the case of Facebook, that you really can't have a system like Facebook and its algorithm and be a responsible publisher of information at the same time. Um, and so that's another reason this is happening is that some truly bad stuff is going on in those platforms. So that's a long answer to your question, but it's a complex issue. So there's no simple answers. Right. And you called out Rupert Murdoch and News Corp. Uh, there's a lot of consolidation in the media in Australia. And you mentioned how that the media there uh, has a role to play in influencing what legislation comes through. Do you think that that has a big influence on why we're seeing this law come out of Australia because of the consolidation of media forces there? Uh, I think it's one reason, uh, but that power of the um, newspaper lobby, if you will, is present elsewhere as well. Okay. It's present in France, it's present in, in uh, Spain, UK, Australia. It's big because um, Murdoch, who's been very critical of the platforms, owns about 70% of the print press. Right. And I think uh, a lot of the criticism has been directed at Facebook over the last couple of weeks because of how they responded to this upcoming law by basically turning off any Australian news sources off of Facebook's platforms altogether. Yeah. Now, it could be argued, though, that this was just a way of protecting themselves from liability, because once this law came into action, if they didn't already have licensing deals set up, they were going to be held liable and that this was kind of a natural foreseeable reaction to the fact that this law was in the pipeline. Um, we now know that Facebook and Australia are communicating and seem to be able to reach a deal. Uh, Google was able to reach licensing agreements with some of these publishers. And I think that makes sense for Google because a lot of their product revolves around being able to redirect to that information. Whereas Mark Zuckerberg says that only 4% of Facebook's news feed uh, makes up news at all, let alone Australian-based news sources. Mm -hmm. So let's, I think let, we can have a more nuanced conversation about how Facebook reacted. So do you think that it was reasonable for Facebook to, at least in the short term, react the way they did? Well, it's reasonable in the context of negotiations that you assume are going on. And when you are in negotiations and you have to give and get, you know, you do things to let the other side know what you can do. And so it's an adversarial procedure, if you will. So it makes sense in that way. Um, it makes sense in another way too, which is you alluded to this. News is far more important for Google than it is for Facebook. I don't know if the 4% figure is accurate. There's no reason to trust any figures from Facebook actually. Um, but it's certainly, you can imagine Facebook uh, existing and profiting healthy profits as it has now without news, but it's very hard for Google to do that. So that's that's an important difference between the two. And I think it it's responsible for their different uh, decisions in this case. I, I think you're absolutely right that Facebook used their reaction as kind of a, a leverage in the negotiation. Um, but do you think that there is also a principled stance that maybe they were taking in that the free and open internet, uh, the kind of agreed upon use is that you can link out to other URLs and that Australia's law would have in some ways created kind of a splintering of the internet where a certain area or targeted platforms like Facebook and Google in particular are no longer allowed to hyperlink? Yes. Um, the relationship between the traditional press and linking has always been fraught and uneven. Going back to the rise of the web in the uh, mid-1990s and the rise of blogging around 1999, and it's been a terrible, sorry history where 
traditional press didn't get linking, didn't do it, um, was reluctant to send people to other sites, was um, uncharitable in the way that it distributed links. Uh, and there's always been something suspicious about linking to legacy newspapers online. And this is one of the most um, uh, obvious ways they have had trouble uh, adjusting to the net. And I think the whole idea of a link tax is crazy. Um, the notion that you're stealing from someone if you link to them is crazy. Um, those who have said newspapers are protesting uh, links to them, but when they borrow stuff from other people, they don't think of paying them, which is true. Um, you can find traditional news organizations online after a big event, a disaster, a car crash, a shooting, begging people for their photos without necessarily paying them. Um, so this whole history is... Uh, is ugly <laughs> uh, and I don't trust anything the traditional newspapers say about linking, but I don't trust the platforms either. Um, so there you go. Yeah, I, I think you framed it perfectly, which is this idea of a link tax and also kind of the hypocritical nature of that because so much of the news articles we see today feature uh, Twitter embeds, for example, and lots of other linking out to the original source. And so I think, uh, and maybe this can be like the last kind of couple points here on this, on this area so we can move on to what you're doing with the membership puzzle project. But I think a link tax is less effective less nuanced and targets uh, unfairly just one or two companies when what you could do is just do some kind of a revenue share tax where you say that certain percentage of Facebook or Google's profits are earmarked for the publishers that are providing the majority of content to those services. Do you think a, a revenue share tax is a more effective way of accomplishing the same goals? In general, this crisis in Australia has allowed me to think through, well, what do I really believe? Like, what would I do? What would I like to see? Um, and I think where I have come down is um, I'm in favor of some sort of tax solution. It could be uh, a revenue tax. It, it could be a tax on internet advertising. I think I would rather go that direction. So I think there should be a tax on internet advertising than then and with which could generate quite a lot of of money and then with that money you need some sort of public agency or semi-public agency to distribute it to journalism real journalism public service journalism in an equitable and intelligent manner that doesn't favor the incumbents that doesn't reward those who have a political in uh, and that supports innovation, penalizes those who are just trying to extract profits from dying companies rather than invest in them, um, which is not easy. All of those things are incredibly hard. And so creating the mechanism for distributing the money from that tax, I think is a huge public policy challenge, but not impossible. Uh, and so that's the direction that I would like to see things go is, is a tax on internet advertising. And then that would create a kind of a fund to support public service journalism. And then we'd have to figure out and argue about how uh, that fund operates. Um, that, uh, but we're not anywhere near that now because uh, the incumbents are manipulating the political system in their favor. Uh, and the platforms are just trying to get away with as little damage to their current business model as they can. Right. And you talk a lot about the problem with the business model for publishers and kind of the lack of innovation. Uh, a lot of publishers perhaps thought that when they moved online, they would be able to get their fair share of the online advertising revenue. We've mm -hmm. seen that there seems to be a black hole, uh, a gravitational pull of advertising dollars into Facebook and Google at a disproportionate amount. And that's why you actually are a really big proponent of the membership model. So can you talk to us a little bit about what is the membership puzzle project and what is the goal there? 
Sure, but I have to correct something that you said before I do that. Um, you referred to a disproportionate share of advertising going to Google and Facebook. Um, and I, I really don't think there's any basis for that. Um, I, I think it's a very difficult argument to make that um, advertising is somehow deserved or should be reserved for certain players in the system or certain publishers. Um, and the truth is that that digital advertising as created by Google and Facebook is just a better product than traditional newspaper advertising, even after that was taken online. Uh, and so it isn't really smart. It isn't really good policy to kind of even unconsciously think of, of advertising revenues as somehow belonging to one publisher or uh, or another. And, and, and I would add here that one of, one of the things that happened during the newspapers, the daily newspapers long, long reign as a near monopoly product is that um, in metro markets where there ended up usually being one newspaper dominant in a given metropolitan area, um, the penetration rates for those properties actually started falling way, way before the internet. They started falling in the 1960s. So where in the 1960s, you might've had 90% penetration area in a market like Memphis or um, San Jose, meaning 90% of the homes in the area received the newspaper. By the mid 1990s, that would have been down to under 60 and sometimes under 50%. At the same time, in the same interval, 1960s to 1990s, newspapers raise their prices for advertising, even when you factor in inflation. So, so you had a situation where the newspaper was reaching far less of the community. It used to be all the community, now it's closer to half. And yet it was charging more for advertising in that medium. Now, how is that possible? Well, it's only possible under minority conditions. It's only possible when there's nowhere else to go. And it's important to uh, keep those kinds of events in the background when you, when you say a disproportionate share of advertising, what's the right propor proportion? Um, now, because of this crisis in revenue, created by the success in digital advertising of Google and Facebook, which today taken around 80% of new digital dollars poured into advertising go to one of those two firms. Um, we have to look at every other possible way to subsidize public service journalism. And that has led most publishers to turn away from the advertisers and look at the readers and say, we're gonna have to get the revenue from them. And there are two different ways of doing that. One of which generally goes by the term subscription and the other goes by the term membership. So subscription is the one we know more um, commonly. It's a product relationship. If you want the Wall Street Journal product, you have to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. And if you don't, you don't get the product. Um, we understand that system very well from magazines and from newspapers. Uh, in membership, the idea is different. Instead of buying the product, you join the cause because you believe in the importance of the work. You think this journalism is important and it needs to be shared. Shared not only by the people who are members, but by people who are not members because um, the believers in the cause, the people who become members um, want the journalism to spread to as many people as possible. This has always been how membership worked in public radio in the United States. People support their local public radio station. They think public radio is important. They think NPR is a good product and they want it to be available to people in Salt Lake City, in Seattle, 
uh, in Chicago. And so they joined their public radio station. So for the last uh, three and a half years, I have been the director of something called the Membership Puzzle Project, which is studying how membership models for the support of serious journalism work in different situations around the world. And in most of those situations, membership is not providing 100% of the revenues or even most of the revenues, but it is a revenue stream that can be combined with other streams to make for a sustainable um, news site. Uh, and how you do that and how you combine different sources of revenue and how you design a membership program so that it's popular and effective is what we call the membership puzzle. And so we've been studying this for, for about four years. Okay, and would you, uh, has your research shown that the membership model is more effective or less effective when there's a paywall? Well, the, one of the most important things about the membership model is that it doesn't require a paywall. Right. And this is important because um, a lot of people can't afford uh, quality journalism. A lot of people can't afford the Wall Street Journal, for example. It's a pretty expensive product. Financial Times is an expensive product. Um, and because members are joining the cause, not in a product relationship, but they support the kind of journalism that is done, um, then it doesn't make sense for there to be a paywall. Um, Vox.com, which was started um, by Ezra Klein and Melissa Bell uh, and Matt Iglesias in um, the previous decade, has a membership program. They call it Contributions. And the people who contribute to a stronger Vox.com do so explicitly because they want Vox.com journalism to be out there. They want the Vox explainers to be floating around and they probably would give less money if it was behind a paywall. So um, the, that's one of the biggest differences between subscription and membership is membership does not require a paywall. Now you can still combine subscription and membership um, so they're not complete opposites, but they are different directions that you can go in when you're trying to create a sustainable news site. And would you consider services like Patreon and Substack to be membership model enablers, or are those somehow slightly different than the membership model that you guys are working on at the Puzzle Project? Um, well, it depends. You can have a, a Substack newsletter that is completely closed off to those who don't subscribe. And that's a subscription product. Um, and you can have a Substack newsletter that is completely open to anyone who comes across it, but the strongest supporters, the believers, the junkies, if you will, um, give money because they think it's important. Uh, or you can have some sort of combination in between where um, in order to get the full product, you have to subscribe, but if um, you can't do that or don't want to do that, that you get some version of it. Dave Roberts recently started a newsletter. He used to be at Vox about um, climate change and energy. Um, and it, for the three times a week version you pay and for the once a week version you don't. And so there are all sorts of combinations in there. Um, but I define membership as um, locating your strongest supporters and persuading them to support you. Okay. And you've, I've heard you talk before about some of the benefits that arise from a membership-based newsroom. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just list a couple, but then I'd like you to list you know, all of the benefits that you can think of. So uh, one is that you're just not supported by corporate interests or advertisers. You're supported directly by your readership. So your loyalty and your efforts are aimed towards servicing your readers. Um, Another is that, uh, I let's see, what were some of the other, why don't you go ahead and list all the different benefits that you think arise from that structure of a newsroom? Mm -hmm. Well, if you can go ad free, 
which is not always possible for everybody. But if you can go ad free, that's huge because advertising distorts a news site in many different ways. Um, the most obvious and the one that we talk about all the time is uh, clickbait, you know, just having to, to meet traffic requirements in order to um, drive revenue uh, changes everything you're doing. Um, it means that you kind of have to do the same stories that others are doing if those stories are potent in driving traffic, which means you kind of lose control of your editorial agenda because you can't afford to ignore that controversy, even if that controversy isn't very important or doesn't jive with your editorial philosophy. Um, and so if you can avoid advertising, then you don't have two masters, you only have one. You're serving the readers. You're not trying to serve them through having this other master called the advertiser, and that's a big deal. Uh, other advantages uh, of membership are that your members know stuff. In, in fact, you can, dis you can see them as a unique knowledge community. And if your members know stuff, then you can try and get that knowledge flowing in to uh, make better journalism. Uh, and that's a big area of membership that I'm interested in that I think in the future is gonna rank a lot more. Within your membership body, you're gonna have experts in certain things. If you can find out who they are and what their expertise is, you can create a database and the members can be uh, sort of on call to help you with your journalism, whether it's checking your facts before you publish or um, having people to quote or getting advice about where you can find good evidence, good documents, uh, or spreading the word about a work of journalism to an expert community that might find it of note, um, that they can be very uh, valuable. Um, also, interacting with your members um, teaches you why they're members and teaches you why they're supporting you, and what they expect. And when you learn what your readers and members expect, you get better at serving them. And you can reduce what's called in the subscription, but also the membership business, uh, what's known as churn, which is the portion of your current um, uh, members or subscribers that is um, giving up their um, use of the product and have to be replaced by new users or new members. Churn, as it's called in the business, is, is very expensive. Um, it's much cheaper to keep people than it is to find new, new people and onboard them. Uh, and so um, having a strong relationship with your members uh, teaches you what their expectations are. Um, and then finally, for journalists themselves, having to communicate to members, having to make clear um, what they're getting, having to be transparent with them, explain how you work, um, explain, for example, your budget, how you make money, um, or something like what good journalism actually costs to make. Uh, the relationship with members helps your journalism because now you're not thinking of the audience out there as like a distant abstraction and you're not doing your journalism for professional peers and prizes. You have to actually serve a live public and there are all kinds of advantages to that. Yeah, and one of those other advantages that I've heard you talk about is how the current news system is designed for what you called daily content production uh, mm -hmm. and not public understanding. So right. what, what other solutions besides uh, a membership model, are there other pieces or other pillars uh, that are needed in the news ecosystem to kind of solve these problems, the trust crisis as it is today? Well, this goes back to a piece that I published in my blog in 19, or excuse me, in uh, 2008 called National Explainer. This is before the launch of Vox.com and before the explainer was a well-known genre in journalism. Um, and to tell you a, a, a little story, it won't take too long. Um, 
my wife had discovered this podcast, which was called The Giant Pool of Money, explaining the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, which is made by, um, uh, by uh, what's, what's the name of the podcast I'm thinking of? It was made by NPR and This American Life. And at the time, it was This American Life's number one downloaded episode uh, in its history. And it's a one hour explainer of the financial crisis that includes everything from the homeowner buying the house uh, he can't afford to the um, uh, local mortgage company that sold him the mortgage to the big banks in New York that package those mortgages into financial instruments to the investors in Hong Kong who bought those financial instruments. And, uh, and at every step, what sort of incentives uh, they were acting on so that when you were done listening to this thing, you understood the entire story and why it mattered, how it happened, why it was a disaster, all the different parts and, and how they fit together. And part of the reason that it was so effective is that the makers of the giant pool of money the staff at NPR and This American Life um, were themselves uh, ignorant outsiders wondering how could this happen? And they sort of started from the position that the listener was in. Um, and I remember the rise in that period in summer of 2007, I think it was, where this, um, this term, this phrase, subprime mortgage lenders which I didn't understand at all, kept showing up in the business pages and was kind of like mentioned in headlines. And I was kind of like annoyed by it because I didn't understand why I kept hearing about these subprime mortgage lenders and who cares if they're going out of business? Like, why does that uh, affect me? And I noticed after listening to this podcast that I started to pay attention to subprime mortgage news. I started to have an interest in the updates, what was still going on in this story, because I had the necessary background to interpret those updates. And it, a, a certain light bulb went off for me when I had that experience, because I, I realized for a long time that the new system isn't designed for that. It's not actually designed for understanding at all. It's designed to produce one damn thing after another, one story after another. In fact, one of the reasons people go into journalism, they may not always admit it or realize it, but some do. But one, one reason people go into journalism is because they can get a story, figure out what's going on, write it up that day or that week, publish it, and then go on to something completely different. And that's not, a bug in this is that's a feature. That's what they like about journalism. And so for all kinds of reasons, the incentive structure in the news system is to just um, pile up one update after another instead of providing people with a kind of architecture of understanding that allows them to build on the updates to create um, competence and, and comprehension. Uh, and so I, I began to see these two kinds of journalism, the background and then the updates that depend on the background as different products, but very compatible products. Because if you could succeed at giving people the necessary background, you would in effect create new customers for the updates, which is exactly what happened to me. And so I still see this as a major defect in the new system. It's not as glaring as it once was, um, but there's a big difference between giving people the background they need to understand news stories and giving them the updates, which is the latest thing that happened in those stories. Yeah, what you just said reminds me of something else I've heard you speak to before, which is kind of this idea of uh, deciding which news stories to focus on based on your measurement of urgency. Can you break mm -hmm. that down? Mm 
Yeah, this is another little flaw in the news system and I've tried to imagine a fix for. Um, one of the problems with the way the news comes at us is that we receive what's new today. But what's new today is not the same thing as what's true today. Uh, or even more to the point, what's still true today and was true yesterday. Uh, and the COVID crisis, you know, is perfect for that. It's, 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 there may be nothing new in it, but it's still there, just like the Flint water crisis. Um, and, and so I came up with this, this idea of an urgency index, which would be just a product that a newsroom could make that ranked the most urgent public problems and ongoing news stories uh, from most to next most. Uh, and I saw it as a product because the urgency index, these are the most urgent public problems, urgent news stories, um, would be a, a live thing. It would some, it'd be something that would change. Um, maybe it would change uh, quickly sometimes, or it could change uh, in a slow, more evolutionary way when, for example, a problem was solved. And so it went off the, um, the urgency index. For example, when two Boeing planes go down for the same reason, that's an urgent problem because all those planes are out there flying. But once they're taken out of circulation and we figure out what the problem is and it's fixed, then it drops off the urgency index because it's not urgent anymore. Um, and so uh, this idea of an, of an urgency index is a little bit different than what people think uh, is that the uh, system we already have, which is like the front page has you know, the most important items at the top and the, the sort of medium important items are in the middle and the less important but fun featurey things are at the bottom. And that's true, that, that's sort of a system, a ranking system and it sort of kind of transfers over to the homepage. But that's just dealing with what's new today. That, that's, that's all about, here's what we have for you that we made over the last 24 hours. And the urgency index is capable of registering not only what happened over the last 24 hours that's really important, but what's still important, even though it's not new. And this is still a weakness in the um, new system that nobody has really tried to fix yet. Yeah, and uh, one other thing that I wanted to touch on with you is this idea of the false equivalency bias, this uh, what, what you've called uh, both sideism. I think this is really important to touch on because uh, it, gives the veneer of objectivism, um, but sometimes it's actually, uh, in many ways, it's, it's bad journalism. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if maybe off the top of your head, you can give an example uh, of really bad false equivalence. Well, um, a very simple one is uh, when um, people say all presidents lie, <laughs> you know, which is true. It's a true statement, but to compare the record that Biden has so far with Trump's record in the White House is ridiculous, right? Now, Biden has said things that the fact checkers have had to say that's wrong. Um, but the rate of falsehoods, the seriousness of falsehood, and the sort of the gales or storms of falsehood that Trump is famous for just aren't there. Uh, and so if we say, well, all presidents lie or both, both of them lie, we're, we're distorting the picture as um, Norm Ornstein of American Enterprise puts it, um, I'm paraphrasing him, um, a, uh, a balanced account of an imbalanced phenomena distorts reality. Uh, and uh, this is a problem in journalism for um, a simple reason, alongside the production of news, journalists in the mainstream media are constantly engaged in another manufacture, which is of their own innocence. And what I mean by innocence is 
they're constantly trying to persuade us that they don't have a stake, they don't have a side, um, they're not part of this party or that party. Um, uh, we are unbiased, we're, we're in the middle, um, we, we, we don't have a stake, we don't have an interest, we don't have a philosophy. So you should trust us because we uh, don't have a side. Uh, and uh, if that demand show that you don't have a side is constant, well, what it means is that you've got to distort your story all the time in order to, sh to show how innocent you are. It's sort of like if you're an NBA fan um, or a college basketball fan, you know how players will sometimes try to show the refs that they're not pushing. They'll say, they'll go like this with their hands. Like, they see, I, I I, I'm following the, the rules. I'm not. I'm not following. Uh, and there's that element of that uh, in journalism. And so this need to show how even-handed you are is a kind of bias in itself, and it's become particularly um, challenging and difficult over the last um, few years, uh, in my opinion. Of course, a lot of people would argue with this because our two party system is being distorted and one of our two parties has become um, anti-democratic and uh, I, I call it counter majoritarian, meaning it's a minority that has to try and um, generate uh, wins for itself by restricting participation, restricting voting, making it harder to vote, making it harder to understand what the party is about. Those are things I write about all the time. So you have, mount, you have growing asymmetry in the two-party system and symmetrical count, account of an asymmetrical system is inherently a distortion, but it's harder to see because it presents itself as balanced. Right. And you, and you mentioned Trump there. And I wanted to ask you, do you think that cable news is going to suffer, not just in ratings, but uh, are they on their way out of importance as far as uh, bearers of the news when it comes to the fact that Trump was such an exciting president and that Biden is, you know, in most respects, a not very exciting president? Do you think that the Trump era was kind of the last hurrah of the cable news network? Um. It's possible that it will be a lot less exciting and the ratings will go down, but um, you have to keep things in proportion. Before Trump, CNN made about, uh, often made like around $600 million a year. Um, during the peak of Trump, it made 1.5 to $2 billion a year. If CNN has to go down to only making $600 million a year, I'm not gonna worry about them too much. Um, and I don't think you should either. These are very lucrative uh, properties and the only people who should really care about that are the stockholders and stock analysts who, who have to estimate what the uh, profits of that company are gonna be. Um, it's possible that uh, audiences decline. It's, po um, it's uh, also possible that the culture war that we're in the middle of will intensify um, and the people at Fox are doing everything they can to make sure it does. I mean, it's, it's a very bizarre and upsetting thing to tune into Fox right now and find out um, that um, the January 6th riot never happened, that um, the 2020 election was stolen, that COVID is a myth in order to for the government to control you. This is literally the programming right now on, on Fox. And that's exciting, you know? It's, it's exciting in a bad way, but it's exciting. So I don't really know. I don't have a prediction about what's gonna happen to the traffic. I, I do think that the news system and, and the journalism profession has to think through and start figuring out its response to this fact that I mentioned earlier that we have a two party system and one of the two parties has become anti-democratic. And I don't think that the journalism world is ready for that. I don't think the, um, the news organizations that think of themselves as mainstream uh, have any policy in place for that. 
Um, and I don't think they can ignore it either. And you saw that this weekend, actually, when the third ranking member of the House, Republican House, um, went on ABC News, Steve Scalise, and was basically un unable to say that Biden was legitimately elected president and instead began to talk up these episodes of fraud that Republican leaders have persuaded uh, their voters of. And in journalism, not just among critics like myself, but within the profession itself, there's now a big debate about whether you should even have those people on the air because they are um, distributing misinformation. This is one of the big issues that arose during the Trump years is when you have a story that's clearly news, but the people involved at the center of it are spreading disinformation, do you still cover that story? Do you have to cover that story? It came up a lot with the um, COVID briefings that Donald Trump was running in uh, earlier in 2020. Um, and this issue of, of dis distributing misinformation by covering news that does qualify as news um, hasn't really been given the kind of um, serious examination and criticism that it should be. And I have to go in three minutes, so we'll have to make this the last question. Okay, uh, then I'll fire off the last two questions I ask every guest. The first question is Bitcoin. Are you a believer or not so much? Neither. I, I don't pay much attention to it. Okay. And last question for you here, Jay, is are we living in a simulation? <laughs> uh, no, I wouldn't go that far, but we're living in a world where realism requires us not to put too much faith in reality. Okay. Great. Well, Jay, thank you for joining us today on the Credit Podcast. Do you want to give listeners a couple of links where they can go and follow your work? I'll be sure to include them in the bio. Jay Rosen underscore NYU on Twitter would be the way to start following me. And pressthinkoneword.org is where you can find my writing. And you should put a, a link to that piece, National Explainer in 2008, uh, into the show notes for this episode. I will be sure to do that. Jay Rosen, thank you for coming on and have a great day. Thank you. All right, Chase, thanks for the great questions.